So maybe we will start. And our next speaker is Ryan Ronan from CUNY, who will talk on an asymptotic for the growth of Markov Horvitz tuples. All right, thank you very much, Mel. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so what I'll be presenting today is joint work with uh, Alex Gambord and Michael McGee. Uh, so let's dig in here. I guess uh, I should probably tell you what a Markov Hurwitz tuple is, but to do that, the first thing I want to tell you about, uh, talk about is uh, what a Markov triple is. Let's, let's start at the easier case. Uh, so this is uh, the so-called Markov equation, which is a Diophantine equation, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 3xyz. As soon as we see a Diophantine equation, I think the first thing we're looking for is, uh, does this have any integral solutions? And uh, you stare at it long enough and you see, oh, of course, there's at least one, um, sub in one for every coordinate. And one squared plus one squared plus one squared is famously three times one times one times one. Okay, so there's at least one solution. In fact, there are much more than just the one solution. There are infinitely many solutions. Uh, so this uh, equation was first studied by Markov in 1879, and there are all sorts of interesting number theoretic applications to this specific equation. I'm not going to really be really getting into any of these in, in this talk. Um, uh, looking at the program, I see our next speaker might uh, be uh, hinting more at, at some of these applications. Uh, but rest assured, the applications exist, and uh, they're quite interesting. Um, so now that we know that solutions to this equation actually exist, uh, maybe the next question we might ask, well, I already sort of gave uh, part of it away, uh, are there infinitely many solutions? And uh, the answer is yes. And then uh, maybe the next question you might ask is, well, how did they grow? Um, how many solutions are there uh, with a maximum coordinate less than or equal to say R? Um, so if we denote by M the set of let's say positive integral solutions to this equation. We'll call these the Markov triples. And maybe we denote this function M of R, which is counting the number of Markov triples with maximum coordinate less than or equal to R. Then there are some results out there that uh, give some asymptotics for this M of R function, okay? Uh, so the most famous, uh, or one of the most famous results here um, is a result by Zagier in 1982, uh, who said that uh, this counting function is, uh, is approximately uh, a C times log R squared. And there's also this nice big O error term here, uh, log R times log log R squared. Um, and this got improved a little bit in 1995. Uh, McShane and Riven trimmed off a little bit of that uh, big O error term, uh, shaved off a factor of log log R. Okay. Uh, so this is sort of the, 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 the Markov equation, uh, but this is actually just the n equals three case of the type of equation that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, because you see this Markov equation enough and you're sort of uh, naturally tempted to try to generalize it. Um, and there's kind of one natural generalization staring at you in the face. Maybe instead of looking at the sum of three squares, maybe you look at the sum of n squares. Uh, so that's the equation I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, this is the so-called Markov Hurwitz equation. Uh, so now we're going to be looking at an equation x1 squared plus x2 squared plus all the way up to plus xn squared. And we're going to compare that to the product of x1 through xn times some parameter a. So a here is some constant. If you want to make the analogy back to the Markov equation, you might say, okay, maybe a should be n. That's, that's sort of the most direct generalization. Uh, but today we're going to be a bit general than that. We'll just say A is a constant. If, if you want a specific constant, you can visualize N in your head here and uh, you're not going to lose too much. Um, when A is equal to N, uh, we can quickly see that that nice uh, example that was staring us in the face earlier easily generalizes to this N variable setting, right? One squared plus one squared uh, N times is equal to N times one, 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 one. So if A is equal to N, this has at least one solution, the solution where all of the coordinates are equal to one. Uh, so that's good. This is not a vacuous equation. Uh, so uh, we're gonna be interested in counting solutions to this equation today. Uh, let's see, to be a bit more formal here, let's say uh, V of Z plus is going to denote the set of solutions to this equation with a positive integral coordinate. Uh, we're gonna call these the Markov Hurwitz tuples now rather than triples. Um, I should also say here, uh, the Hurwitz here is referring to the, the mathematician Hurwitz who studied this in uh, 1907, uh, roughly. Uh, okay. Uh, so let's see, when, uh, like I said, when n and a are both three, this just reduces back to the Markov equation. Okay. 
And this is the main result that I'll be talking about today. So again, this is joint work with uh, Gambord and McGee. Uh, so what does this result say? It, it says, uh, if we are in a situation where this equation has infinitely many positive integral solutions, then there's some constant. The constant depends on both n and a, and some other constant beta, which only depends on n, such that the number of positive integral solutions in a ball of radius r with respect to the L infinity norm, so in other words, the set of positive integral solutions to this equation with maximum coordinate less than or equal to r, this is approximately that constant c times log r to the beta plus some little o log r of beta term. Uh, all right, so compare this to Zagier's result for the n equals 3 setting and a equals 3 setting. Uh, we might notice uh, right away that our error term here is certainly weaker. We don't have an explicit big O error term. Or we're just going to say it's little o of the main term. Uh, and the other sort of obvious thing staring at us in the face is this uh, beta over here. Uh, what, what is that beta? Uh, Zagier had this nice explicit uh, formula uh, that for the, for the n equals 3 case, we have a constant times log r squared. So we have this constant times log r beta now in the general case. Uh, so th there's something to say here. First, let me briefly outline some of the previous work. Uh, so we already talked about Zagier's result, which I've rewritten here in this slightly uh, new notation. Um, and then the previous best result for the general case uh, was a result by Baragar, who had an asymptotic for the exponent. So Baragar was the first uh, person to, to notice this number beta here. And, uh, you know, if, if this were an in-person talk, this would be the part where I would look around the room and I would say, uh, okay, should we try to guess what beta is now? Because uh, in the n equals three case, beta is two. So when n equals four, what do we think beta is? And you know, probably everyone in the room would guess, oh, when n equals four, probably beta is three. That would be, that would make sense. Uh, surprisingly, that's not the case. Uh, so these are bounds that Baragar found um, in, in his papers in the 90s. Uh, in particular, when n equals four, this exponent here is not three, it's not two, it's some number between 2.43 and 2.48. And when n equals five, we have this other, the, these other bounds for beta of five. Beta is six, we have these bounds here. So in general, this, this number beta is not an integer, okay? Uh, which is already somewhat interesting. And it's sort of an open problem. Our, our work doesn't really answer here what, what exactly this number beta is. Is this some famous number we all already know? Or is this some number that's, you know, some transcendental number that appears in this problem and, and maybe nowhere else? Um, so our work still does not have an answer for that. Um, uh, but we do have some slightly new insight into what the beta represents. And potentially that could someday lead to some maybe better bounds on beta or you know, hypothetically, is there maybe some uh, explicit formula for what beta is? That would be interesting. Uh, but as of now, we have nothing to report about that. Okay. So what does our result say? Um, probably it's most useful to compare this to Baragar's result over here and just to emphasize Baragar's uh, asymptotic uh, refers to the asymptotic of the exponent. So we have a, a, a true main term here in our result. We have a constant times log r to the beta and our error term is just a little o of the main term. Okay? So that is our improvement in this case. Okay? All right, so to talk you through uh, what our, uh, our new insight was here that let us make some progress in this problem, um, I probably should catch you up to speed on uh, the proofs that Zagier and Baragar, Baragar use because our work sort of builds upon that result. Uh, so for the next little bit of this talk, I'll be just talking through some um, observations about how to generate these tuples. Uh, and these are all observations that were known to Zagier and Baragar. And then uh, towards the end of the talk, I'll try to indicate what our uh, primary new contribution was that let us make some progress here. Okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, so uh, the, the key ingredient to studying uh, this problem in the n equals three case or the general n case uh, is using these so-called Markov-Hurwitz moves. Uh, so what do I mean by this? Um, take that Markov-Hurwitz equation. Let me go back to it over here. Take this Markov-Hurwitz equation. And instead of thinking of this as an equation with n variables, why don't we fix all but one of those variables, okay? So fix all but one of these as some specific number and leave one as a variable. And then I have a quadratic in that one variable, right? 
So we can rewrite the Markov Hurwitz equation as this nice little quadratic equation in the variable, let's say xj. And we fix all of the other variables. Maybe they're fixed at um, the coordinate of some existing solution, right? We know when a equals n, there's at least one solution staring at us in the face. So maybe we fix all of these other coordinates as the coordinate at that solution. And then we have a quadratic in this other coordinate. And uh, you give this problem to your favorite pre-calculus student. And what they tell you is uh, there are two roots to this quadratic polynomial, probably. Uh, there are most two roots. And they satisfy uh, this equation over here that the sum of these roots should be the negative uh, xj coefficient, OK? And you stare at this long enough and you realize, oh, wait a second. Um, we know all we know the right hand side, right? A is fixed, and we said we fixed the xi's other than xj to be the coordinates of some solution that we know. And then uh, this xj on the left hand side, we know that also because again, we know some solution that we started with. And then there's an unknown here. There's an xj prime that we could solve for. So if the xj prime is different from xj. What this gives us now is a way to take a solution and produce a new solution that also satisfies the Markov Hurwitz equation. So we define these moves here. Again, we'll call these the Markov Hurwitz moves. We omit the jth coordinate. What is j? Let's say j is from 1 to n minus 1. It turns out uh, nothing interesting happens when j equals n. It basically doesn't give you a new solution for whatever reason. But when j is between 1 and n minus 1, we omit the jth coordinate, and we add on some new coordinate at the end, which is, is basically coming here from this uh, equation uh, that should be telling us a new solution. Okay, And the point of these moves here is you sub in your favorite solution to the Markov-Hurwitz equation, and this move should hopefully give you a new solution. Okay, uh, So you get this nice tree-like structure. Um, so let's try to visualize the tree here. Um, so this is the Markov uh, case, n equals 3, a equals 3. So this is the classic Markov equation. We said 1, 1, 1 was a solution to that equation. So what happens if I try to apply one of those moves to 1, 1, 1? I would remove one of these coordinates and then replace it with the coordinate, I guess it would be like 3 times 1 times 1 minus 1. Okay, so I apply that move. Oh, I have a new solution now, 1, 1, 2. This is a Markov triple. Sub that into the Markov equation and we'll check out. Um, and in this case, if you apply either of those two moves that I talked about earlier, um, you'll see that both of those moves give you 1, 1, 2. So in this case, the first move and the second move applied to 1, 1, 1, they give you the same thing. Okay? So we can keep applying these moves and so on and so on. Eventually, you get to the point where the moves are giving you different triples. Um, and then from that point on, you're going to get different triples, triples every time you apply these two moves to an existing triple. So you get this nice branching tree over here. Um, and it turns out, uh, it's not completely obvious here, but it turns out that not only are these all triples to the Markov equation, these are actually the only solutions to the Markov equation. Uh, you know, Obviously, I'm truncating the tree here. But if you imagine the infinite tree, that infinite tree there gives you all of the solutions to the Markov equation. And this is good news if you want to count solutions to the Markov equation or the Markov Hurwitz equation, uh, because now you've reduced the counting problem from mysterious solutions floating you know, in uh, Zn uh, to studying a tree and maybe studying the action of moves on a tree. Okay? Um, here's the tree when n and a are both 4. We apply the moves to 1, 1, 1, 1. Uh, you see this a similar sort of tree structure. Now I generally have three branches at each step. Um, if I can draw your eyes to the rightmost branch, uh, there's two things that might stand out to you. There's the obvious thing, which is the rightmost branch is uh, not so symmetric with the rest of the tree uh, because we only have, um, it looks like we're only getting two branches off of each node instead of three that we generally get everywhere else. Um, that's actually not the part I want to draw your attention to, even though that's probably what your eyes see first. Uh, the part that I actually want to draw your attention to over here is uh, look at the maximum coordinates of what's, uh, look at the maximum coordinate of the tuples on the rightmost branch. So on the rightmost branch, the maximum coordinate down here is 571. 
and compare that to the maximum coordinate of the leftmost branch, uh, which is, uh, what is that, like 99 million, okay? So several orders of magnitudes difference in the maximum coordinate of the leftmost branch versus the rightmost branch. And if you look at these other maximum coordinates, you'll see uh, there really is a gap here between like the left side and the right side. Um, that in general, these maximum coordinates, they tend to be closer to 99 million probably than they do to this 571. So this rightmost branch is, is really growing much slower than the other branches. Um, and actually this, this poses a problem here because if you're trying to reduce this counting problem from counting solutions to counting the growth of a tree, well, now I have a tree where one branch is growing much slower than the others. It's, it's sort of much harder to um, uh, account for that. Um, and very roughly speaking, this, this rightmost branch is sort of the primary obstruction in this, in this problem and, and why Baragar, uh, where Baragar ran into some trouble. Um, and, and, and dealing with this right branch is actually our primary new contribution. Uh, so before I can get to exactly how we addressed that and how that comes into play, let me give you uh, a little bit more uh, of the ingredients of the proof uh, that, again, essentially Zaghi and Baragar used these same ideas. Uh, so this is not necessarily anything new. Uh, first, you can take that markov hurwitz equation. It turns out you can normalize it. That parameter A doesn't really do too much. You can kind of absorb it into the other coordinates. And now instead of looking at positive integral solutions, you're looking at solutions on this lattice over here. Okay, that's, you know, that's, you know a, an unexciting normalization. Okay, those moves that I talked about earlier, I can rewrite these now for move, as moves on the um, normalized equation. Okay, uh, and and here's the big idea that's that's important for getting a lot of this to work. Um, we have these moves which are representing nonlinear functions, right? We have this annoying product here. Uh, it's a big old product of a lot of these z coordinates. And uh, well, a nonlinear map is fine, but a linear map is almost always easier to work with. And as soon as you see this product, you're sort of tempted to say, is there a way to linearize this in some way? Can I turn that product into a sum? Can I take a log maybe of each coordinate and get a linear map here? And you can't quite do that because the last coordinate of this move is not exactly a product. It's a product minus something else. But if that product is very large, you can kind of uh, get away with approximating that coordinate uh, as just the product of the zi's where i is not equal to j. And if you do that, then you can go ahead and take logs and what ends up happening is you induce these linear maps now, which are approximately corresponding to the original nonlinear maps that we were trying to study. Okay. So we get these linear maps here, I'll call this gamma, and we're led to study the action of these um, uh, uh, linear maps on this non-negative ordered hyperplane over here, uh, which is basically the analog of the solutions to the Markov Hurwitz equation after we normalize, after we linearize. We're looking at what these uh, maps gamma do to this non negative ordered hyperplane. So, this is now becoming sort of a dynamics problem. Okay. Uh, we form the semi group gamma, uh, capital gamma, generated by these n minus one moves. So, we're studying the action of big gamma on H. Um, and I'm going to show you some pictures in a moment here. Uh, at first glance, this hyperplane um, is in Rn. Actually, turns out that um, you can sort of uh, visualize H in R n minus two uh, because this constraint uh, uses up a degree of freedom. And then there's also something to be said about H being invariant by multiplication of R. So you can kind of project down another degree of freedom. Uh, and, and my point with all this is when n equals four, it's possible to visualize H in two dimensions. If you can do that, then you can actually very cleanly see the explicit effect of gamma on H. So that's uh, the pictures I have here. Um, as I start applying uh, the maps gamma to uh, this visualization of H, I'm gradually shrinking it down and I'm getting a nice little attracting set, this uh, sort of cool looking fractal. Um, yeah, if, if this fractal is reminding you of the Rousey gasket, that's not a coincidence. Um, there's, there's some connection here between this fractal and the Rousey gasket. 
Um, and uh, I, I think actually there, there's some speculation that um, understanding the connection between this fractal and the Rousey gasket could give some insight into what that number beta is. Maybe is it related to the Hausdorff dimension of um, uh, you know, possibly uh, this fractal or the Rousey gasket fractal or, or some relationship there or something. Uh, so that's just sort of idle speculation. Okay, so uh, in my remaining four minutes here, I, I should give you some insight into what our primary new contribution is. Um, and it, it boils down to this observation. I said before that that rightmost branch was growing very slowly. There's also this observation here that um, the approximation relating the nonlinear maps to the linear maps um, is related to basically the size of this product, which you can relate to the product of the first n minus two coordinates. And that rightmost branch, that lambda n minus one action, does not increase this product. So again, that rightmost branch of that tree that I showed you earlier, uh, that's, that's proving to be problematic here. Um, it's, it's growing much slower. It's messing up the approximation that we're trying to make between lambda j and gamma j. Um, so any sort of dynamics framework we try to put on this problem is going to run into some difficulty with addressing uh, that slow growing right branch. Uh, so here's the fix. Um, we applied a so-called acceleration to this problem. Um, and, and this is a technique that has been used in some symbolic dynamics um, uh, papers before, uh, uh, but we were the first uh, to apply it in, in this particular setting. Um, and so what is this acceleration? Instead of letting that problematic rightmost move be its own move and its own generator in the semi-group, uh, what if we look at all of the uh, rightmost actions at once, okay? So we replace the original generating set, gamma one through gamma n minus one with this new countably infinite generating set where we first apply a nice move, gamma one through gamma n minus two. And then if we really have to apply a gamma n minus one, we do all of those gamma n minus ones kind of at once. And we treat all of these as, as generators here. And now we form this new semigroup, the so-called accelerated semigroup. And roughly speaking, this allows us to make some progress um, on this problem. Uh, this is the principal insight. Okay. Uh, so to sum up in these last few minutes here, um, uh, our result can be rewritten in this normalized linear setting. Um, in the following way, I, I don't think I have uh, too much time left to go into uh, exactly what the symbolic dynamics part of this argument is. Um, it, you know, I, I have some of the ideas sketched here, uh, but we, we don't have time to get into all that. Um, but essentially, we're following a symbolic dynamics argument outlined in a paper uh, by Lolly uh, from 1989. Um, Essentially, the counting function that you get in this problem, you can take a Laplace transformation of that counting function, or, or rather a Laplace transformation of a, of a certain recursive renewal equation that that counting function um, satisfies. And then uh, after you take this Laplace transformation, you get this transfer operator, and we follow sort of a standard uh, symbolic dynamics argument from that point on. Um, obviously, the accelerated semigroup throws uh, a little bit of a monkey wrench into things because with these countably infinitely many generators, uh, objects that are often sums are now series. So we have to deal with that in some way, uh, but that can all be accounted for. And uh, in the end, uh, sort of the result that you want in the setting does go through. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, and, and then there's some possibility of some future work here. Um, uh, which uh, would build upon a result by Bergen, Gambord, and Sarnak uh, that was announced in 2016, that almost every number that shows up as a solution to the Markov equation is a composite number. And there's some hope that perhaps this can be generalized to the uh, general setting. Um, and, and some of the ingredients for this are already done. They were actually part of my thesis work here when I was a graduate student at the Graduate Center a few years ago. Uh, but there are still some holes to fill in. Um, so. Uh, uh, can this result here be generalized from the Markov equation setting, the n equals three setting to the general setting? Uh, and that's, that's an open problem. Uh, all right, I am just about out of time. So thank you very much for listening and I'll happily take any questions. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Let's see. Um... OK, 
Kevin Johnson says, good to see you, Ryan. But ah. <laughs> that's, that's not a question. Uh, <laughs> good to see you too, or to hear you, hear your uh, written words. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. The next, The next talk will be in five minutes.